You cannot get someone to change their mind by cramming facts down their throat. If you're going to try to change somebody's mind, the best way to do it is through calm, respectful conversation face to face. Now that doesn't always work, but it's sort of the only thing that does work if anything's going to work. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Produced by Soapbox Media. The world needs evidence-based public policy now more than ever. Making the right decisions should not be partisan politics. Please help spread the rational view by going to patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Together, we can make a better future. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, I'm digging into the topic of fake news and the risk of weaponized disinformation campaigns on social media. To enlighten us on this topic, I have a returning guest who provided us with a great perspective last year on how he reached out across the aisle by attending a pseudoscience conference and talking directly with science deniers. If you like what you're hearing, I'd love you to press like on your podcast app and help spread the news about The Rational View. Come talk to us on our Facebook group, The Rational View, and give me your feedback. I'd love to hear from you. Returning guest Lee McIntyre is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University. Formerly executive director of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard University. McIntyre is the best-selling author of Post-Truth, along with 13 other works of fiction and nonfiction, including Dark Ages and The Scientific Attitude. McIntyre has had appearances on CNN, PBS, NPR, and the BBC, and has spoken at the United Nations, the Aspen Institute, and the Vatican. He started in the docu-series Infodemic, Global Conversations on Science and Misinformation. In 2018, McIntyre went undercover at the Flat Earth International Conference in Denver, Colorado, as research on his recent book, How to Talk to a Science Denier, that we talked about in our last interview. And he's just about to publish a new book on disinformation. Lee, welcome back to The Rational View. Thanks for having me back. So last time you were here, we had a a great chat about your book, How to Talk to a Science Denier, where you, you jumped into a pseudoscience conference with both feet. Uh, our interview was very well received, and I think there was a great response to to the, to the discussion on my Facebook group. Your thesis, as always, is, is to not contribute to polarization, I think, by belittling science deniers, but to make uh, personal connections with them and walk with them along uh, the pathway of their reasoning and help them to come to rationality. What, what's the response been to that book since since we last talked? Uh, that you know that book uh, really it, it did pretty well. I've been having usually the publicity season kind of calms down after a few months, but that one has just kind of kept going right up until now that I'm uh, not booking any more events for that, and I'm I'm wanting to book on the uh, uh, the new one. But the the good news for me is that they're related in a way the the two topics because what always happens is I write the book, I go out and I start to talk about it with people. You guys all ask such good questions. And then I realized, wait a minute, I left something out. You know, there's this, and it starts me thinking. And then I write a new book. And so uh, I I got, um, so I had thought I had everything uh, already said about the topic of post-truth and rejection of reason and science denial. But there was this big, important piece that I had missed all along. And that's where the new book comes from. Yeah, I just uh, spoke recently with uh, Dr. Andy Norman, your colleague at Searcy, uh, yeah. about uh, Searcy's attempts to inoculate the public against misinformation. And he suggested I should come and talk to you again uh, about your book. So can you tell me a little bit about what you left out and what you're working on now? Yeah. Okay. So what I left out, um, I've been interested in science denial for a very long time. And the question always comes up, why do people believe what they believe? You know, how, how do they come to it? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And and I'm not just talking there about, you know, the question of facts, you know, what what topics they are. I'm I'm talking about how, really, literally, what are their sources of information? You know, where where are they hearing the things that they're believing? Because what normally happens is people don't just wake up one day and wonder whether they are tracking microchips in their uh, COVID vaccines. They heard that somewhere, and mm-hmm. then you know, and and they believe it. And mm-hmm. so, what I have been, and then another thing happened. The the other thing that that happened in addition to thinking about that. Is it January 6th happened? And Mm -hmm. I started to get very concerned about the fact that rather than making a dent in the science denial problem, it seemed like it had metastasized. And now people weren't just questioning facts about science, but about anything they wanted, including the outcome of an election. And so put those two things together. And I discovered what was really in plain sight the whole time which is that the culprit was disinformation, that somebody was sharing false information because it was to their benefit. And so, and I think this is something I did talk about last time, but I, I mean, I now really understand more about it, that a lot of science deniers are really victims because the information that they believe, the information that's shared with them that causes them to change their beliefs is a lie shared by someone who is profiting from it, not necessarily economically, but in terms of ideology or political power or something like that. And so what I've, I began to realize that it is very important to talk, while it, while it is very important to talk to science deniers and try to convince them to change their mind, in some way that was healing the sick once they're sick. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to start to think about how to keep them from getting sick in the first place. That overlaps with some of the work that uh, Andy and I do at Circe, where we're talking about uh, mental immunity and inoculation theory, you know, how to pre-bunking, not just debunking, how to get people to you know not fall for bad ideas. But sure. in my own work, and my own writing, I became fascinated with this question of disinformation. Because to me, There's this pipeline from creation to amplification to belief. I'd already written about the uh, believers, and now it's time to think about the amplifiers and the creators. How How does disinformation happen? Who's doing it? And how is it getting out there? Because it's really part of pre bunking, isn't it? Just to think about how to get people from becoming deniers. Yeah, I mean, we've set up some systems, and I think the systems of, of media coverage and journalistic integrity have have significantly degraded and now there's these new social media tools out here which really make it easy to spread and amplify disinformation and you 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 touch on that in your book uh it's you know it's a great exploration of some of the issues you know focuses mostly on the u.s angles of u.s politics um one of your complaints that I read in the book is that journalists are failing to provide a balanced message and, and facts are being overcome by opinion because of this. And, and you trace part of this to the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine uh, in 1987. Uh, c- could you explain what that means? Yeah, um, it, you know, it's, it's funny that the question of balance, because I'm not, I mean, in some ways I am calling for them to return to, uh, to balance. and yet. It's this false idea of balance that can be part of the problem. Because I think that what some journalists do is they go in with the mindset that, well, they don't want to be politically biased. They don't want to be part of the story. So they'll let both sides talk. But that can be a real danger. Because if you're talking to somebody who's a scientist and a science denier, you don't put them on the screen and give them equal time and, you know, split screen and equal time and just let them hash it out. That's, that's not the right way to do it. So Mm -hmm. my primary objective is truth, not balance. Um, And the, the issue with the media is that I think that they have a set of priorities that are sometimes aligned with the idea of discovering truth and sometimes work against it. They have their own interests in money 
and engagement. You know, they want the audience to watch. And what causes people to have their eyes glued to the set? Uh, a narrative of, you know, chaos and failure. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and so so that's that's very important. And I mean, the fairness doctrine, it, it's 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 when this started to go bad, when they repealed the fairness doctrine, because all of a sudden networks didn't need to worry anymore about providing balance in their broadcasts. You know, it used to be back in the day that if they had on some person who was on one side of an issue, you know, some partisan issue, they had to have another per- person in. And then now that, um, and sometimes there was a deterrent effect, right? Knowing that they'd have to bring in somebody on the other side, they wouldn't have, you know, the the commentator who was, you know, so, you know, o- o- partisan over on the other side because they they didn't they didn't want to give the, the equal time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But once that was repealed, then you got Rush Limbaugh, then you got Fox News, you know, then you got the idea that um, networks. It, it, they didn't need to achieve balance within the network. Then you were, you know, you were looking at, well, we'll have balance across networks, right? We'll have one that's hard right. We'll have one that's hard left. And, you know, maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. Boy, that that's a, a hard way to present news because <laughs> people don't end up switching back and forth between Fox and CNN and MSNBC. They have their favorite network, and that's what they watch. Mm-hmm. And I'm not there making them all equivalent either. I mean, we just saw in the, in the recent a Dominion lawsuit, Fox News, they present lies. I mean, they they have uh, commentators who will say one thing on their uh, texting and another thing on the air. And, mm-hmm. you know, there is a certain amount of bias, as I just talked about it, you know, other networks and bias toward... Uh, engagement toward, um, you know, false balance toward, uh, uh, sometimes just even toward confirmation bias or cherry picking. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that that they all do a a equally bad job or an equally good job. They've, they've all got things to, uh, to fix, but it is a toxic media environment primarily because some of what's today passing for news is not even attempting uh, to tell the truth. They're just uh, embracing a point of view and only presenting that, even if that means lying. And that's terrible. You know, I mean, we've seen this a lot on social media as well. We, And you mentioned in your books, the al- algorithms of engagement on social media favor shock value over truth. Um, and you have algorithmic amplification of these echo chambers. You know, people... Right click on on something that supports their ingrained biases and they like to follow that rabbit hole down and, and keep getting uh their biases confirmed that the other guys are evil and and oh my god shocking how horrible is this follow 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 and they get deeper and deeper yep. and, it's, and the the algorithm will never give them truth the algorithm is designed to maintain a engagement and it, you basically are, are stuck with with people in these silos that have now completely different versions of reality in their heads it's true if if you've ever sat down at somebody else's computer to look at what their feed looks like it, it, it's sometimes shocking you think what what's uh, what's all this why does this look so different from you know what and you may not even realize you know that, that you've been that your your feed has been curated but but it uh, you know it actually it actually has and so um yeah, so that I mean that can be a problem with social media as well. Though I have to say, they're they're doing better in some small ways. Um, that just today, I was sharing a news story on Twitter, um, and I clicked um, I clicked a retweet, and it said, "Don't you want to read the story first? Well, it was a story that I had already read that morning. So I had already read it that morning on, you know, the I think it was New York Times. And so when I saw it again in somebody's feed on Twitter, I thought, well, I'll just retweet it here. But it, but Twitter didn't know that I had read it on the New York Times. It thought I was sharing a story that I hadn't yeah, even right. read. Mm-hmm. And so that and so that was good for them. That was kind of a nice prompt, you know, to yeah. say, really, you sure you want to share that? I mean, it didn't say literally, are you sure? But it said something like, would 
wouldn't you like to read this story? <laughs> yeah. So like that. So so that that was welcome. But but definitely they could do more. And one of the ways that they could do more is to make their algorithms more transparent. Uh, I think they should have, and I argued for this in the book, um, the algorithm should be available for researchers to study uh, to look for harm. You know, we shouldn't have to wait till a whistleblower comes forward to know that there's great public harm from this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's well known the problems with that. Um, the questions are the solutions, I guess. You you also um, take take a swipe at the Washington Press Corps in your book. You, yeah. you, you quote, uh, they treat politics as something between a baseball game and a Broadway show. And I've seen the same thing in Canadian political and election coverage. Like the, the people that are covering elections and politics, it's all a popularity show. Like who wore the wrong suit? Who who stumbled over their words? There seems to be absolutely no coverage of critical issues that these people are supposed to be working on. Uh, you know, it's not the same standard of journalism as is in my yeah. my parents' time. And, you know, if you watch the the Watergate movie uh, with Robert Redford and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is this is investigative journalism. You know, and the things that they published that Nixon got fired over are are seen as like we wouldn't blink an eye today about the fact that they were tapping the phones on the Democrats right. or or you know, this, right. This is a critical problem for responsible government that it is. The journalists just aren't motivated to to highlight the issues. They they, they aren't they well, don't sell. They, well, it, and you use the right word there right at the end, sell, because it wasn't that long ago that news didn't have to sell. News didn't have to make a profit. News was the uh, the loss leader uh, for the networks. I mean. The public, people forget that the public airwaves belong to the public and they are leased through the government to the broadcasters um, for the public good. And if all they're doing is running commercials and, you know, uh, things to make money, then the question is, well, how is that for the public good? And so as it started out, they had to have news. And so that half an hour of news that every network had every day didn't have to turn a profit because, well, that was their fig leaf to cover the fact. I mean, it was more than a fig leaf. It was important programming. But they, I mean, they only had I mean, fig leaf in the sense that the networks didn't do any more news than they had to, you know, unless it was an assassination or a moon landing. They did not interrupt your primetime broadcast with news because the news didn't make any money. After Ted Koppel uh, with Nightline, after that... Um, after the Iran hostage crisis, they started to figure out that you really, you could make money on news. Viewers started to be there. And then with CNN, you know, once they figured that out, then CNN came forward is all this, about the same time. Once they got the profit motive, I think that was a very dangerous thing. I, I can't remember who that quotation was that you read before, the thing about the Broadway show and a sporting event. That, that wasn't me. I was quoting somebody else's tweet. Okay. But, but another a person that I really like in this debate is uh, Soledad O'Brien, who used to be a, 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 an anchor on CNN. Mm-hmm. And I mean, she, she's a, a great media critic uh, these days who you know, gives one of the best possible pieces of advice I've ever heard. Don't book liars on your program. You know, pe- people, they, networks have people on knowing that they're going to lie. And you might wonder why they do that. I mean, some of it is because they don't want to be accused of political bias. But I think some of it is because it, it engages this narrative of conflict, conflict, conflict. And Oh, you know, I also I heard for the first time from Soledad O'Brien something that I, I now know to be the case. The networks don't just get their ratings anymore uh, overnight, like the old Nielsen ratings, you know, or what, what, how do we do last night? They get those ratings on a minute by minute basis. So they know in real time how they're doing. We're leaving quick. <laughs> Change the subject. Yeah. Yeah, well now, I, and, and I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that they. I know the ra- ratings are taken on a minute by minute basis. I'm not sure they 
get them immediately at the moment. But I know that they can now target it to the point where they can say, and maybe it's the next day, that show killed us, or that segment killed us, or that 10 minutes killed us. We're not going to do that story again. So, I mean, they can dec- so they make coverage decisions based on the overnight ratings. I mean, based on the minute by minute ratings. So, this is a lot of um, good description of the problem. Yeah. The question, the question is, you know, and, and it's it's dangerous. You, you actually quote um, former guest of mine, Dr. Stephen Levitsky, uh, of uh, how democracies die. Yes. On the parallels between the January sixth insurrection and and the Russian Revolution of nineteen oh five. Could you briefly just touch on on what he what he said about that? Yeah, you, you mean 17, 17 right? The, 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 there were two re- Russian revolutions. That is, and I'm not that much of a historian about this, but did he did he mean? I think he was trying to parallel with the nineteen seventeen revolution, the the Lenin uh, revolution. Perhaps. Um, so let me let me be sure that I get this right because he's so articulate on it, and anybody who wants to to see it can just you know go back and watch the your your podcast. I think the danger is this. Oh, yes, the 1905, because that was the dress rehearsal. Now I get it. Yes, you're, you're correct. Here's what he said. Sorry, it took me a second there. No, okay. back in gear. The, the 1905 revolution was a dress rehearsal for the 1917 revolution. And what historians have discovered is that the best predictor of a successful revolution is a failed one just before it. It is a warm-up. It is a it is a way to see, you know, to probe where the um, weaknesses are. And that's the danger, right? That mm-hmm. people learn from a failed revolution. They see what to do differently next time. So to all the people who are saying, well, you know, um, January 6, 2021, I'm sure glad that's over. I'm sure glad that's in the rearview mirror. No, no. I mean... 1905 to 1917, you know, 12 years later. I mean, how, so how, how long before we no longer have to worry about what people learned in the January 6th revolution? I am still worried. I'm, in fact, more worried now because Trump has not gone away. I mean, it would, Trump could have disappeared from the stage. He has not. And the media is now treating him as a serious candidate, because he is, uh, you know, the leading candidate. And there is a very real possibility that he might win. And I heartily believe that would be the end of democracy in the United States. I think he has authoritarian tendencies, and that is where he wants to take us. He's all but told us that that's where he would take us. And the idea that after January 6th, that he's the leading contender in the Republican Party is completely shocking to me. What was shocking to me is is like the lack of codification of the dem- democratic or republican principles uh, that we take for granted in 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 basically the 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 machinery of state, as it were. Like if, if Pence hadn't got up on on January sixth and said, "No, I'm not going to go through with your plan, Donald," what would have happened? Right? If he hadn't said, "No, I'm not going. I'm I am going to." Say these electors are okay. I'm not going to say no. It was close. It it was a close call. And what some people do in the case of a close call is they say, "Phew, glad that's over." And some people learn from it. <laughs> but it's awfully easy to just ignore it, and which is what a lot of people have done. To just like that guy, that cop in the hallway on January sixth, who you know, was luring the protesters up the stairs. And if he had, if he turned that way rather than the other way, they would have gone straight into the Senate chamber, which was full of mm-hmm. people at that moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was close. It was very close. Um, so, and we're still close. Yeah, since, so since that time, you have states that have passed laws that allow state legislatures to overturn their individual re- election yes. results. Is that actually true? Yes. What the uh, hell? That, that's that. That's uh, that's true. Um, now there has been some legislation that has 
been protective as well. Uh, the Electoral Count Act was updated and revised so that, you know, there's a, there, there's not quite the loophole that, that there was. And there has been, um, there was a Supreme Court case in the United States the other day that was decided against this idea that the legislatures could pass their own um, uh, voting rules for a presidential election without any review from the courts. So, I mean, so there has been some, you know, work in the other direction too. But, you know, after a disaster happens and you get a list of, well, these 10 things you should do, we've done about four of them. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I mean that, and, and some, and some things have gotten worse, like that idea about the, the states, and I, I forget which ones they are, but yeah, there was more than one state that passed a law saying that, you know, that the legislatures could, uh, you know, overturn it. I mean, look, if Pence hadn't done what he had done, if he had allowed the fake electors, the Republicans had 26 votes and the, and the Democrats had 24. Is it possible that they could have decided, you know, it, it flipped it to Congress and decided, yes, we're going to install Trump? Yeah, could have happened. Mm -hmm. And think, it could still happen. I think the fact is that, you know, it, it's, from, from my perspective, I can't understand why anyone would support Donald Trump. But, you know, he was like a rock thrown against the window, windshield of the establishment. I think people feel very disenfranchised. Uh, inequity yeah. is, I think, what drives this. And inequity is at its peak uh, since, what, the 20s? Since, you know, just before the Great Depression. Uh, mm -hmm. What we all need to do is realize that our institutions are set up to steal from the poor and give to the rich. So it's not surprising that people want to want to break it all down, I think. And I, I don't think people are taking enough attention to that particular aspect of, well, the, of, the, of the disenfranchisement of the populace. And you put your finger on an important point, which is pre-existing fault lines, pre-existing grievance. That's what a disinformer exploits. They don't often make things up just out of whole cloth. They find some, some fissure. And then they worry it back and forth and try to open it up a little bit wider, you know, understanding that there were some uh, Bernie Sanders supporters who didn't like Hillary. The Russian intelligence service gave them a bunch of memes um, of outrageous things, you know, to try to exploit that, you know, understanding that Jill Stein had a certain following. Uh, disinformation was created to try to boost her. I mean, so, you know, so they, that, you know, the inequality is one important fault line. Race is another fault line. I mean, there are all sorts of fault lines that were exploited through disinformation to try to achieve the, uh, achieve the result. So what is the solution? What do you argue for in your book? How do we, how do we fix this problem before it's too late? Yeah. The book is a small, short manifesto. It's a citizen's guide, practical. Carry it around in your back pocket and pass it on to a friend. Um, and at the, I spend the first few chapters, I mean, you can read the whole book in an hour and a half. Now, I spend the first few chapters just talking about the problem mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, to help figure out how to solve it, what we can do. The last chapter is 10 things that the ordinary citizen can do. And they all have to do with the idea of being awake to the problem. Because I think that one of the worst things that has happened is that we are in a disinformation war and we don't know it. This is partially because um, we are distracted. It's partially because the news media does not report on it as a an information war. They report on it as a political disagreement. They they make they make they always use the word misinformation rather than disinformation. They're not labeling the problem correctly as one of disinformation because once you own the idea that what's going on is information war, 
then you're talking, you're not talking about mistakes, you're talking about lies. And if they're lies, there have to be liars. And who are those liars and why are they lying and what are they getting out of it? That's where I want to put people to work, to wake them up. That's what a manifesto does, right? A manifesto wakes you up to what the problem is. There are practical steps we can take. Um, intervene, trying to intervene with Congress. You know, it doesn't take that many um, letters to Congress <laughs> to, you know, to get to your local congressperson to get them to change their view on an issue. Um, complaints to cable news, you know, uh, all, all complaints to advertisers on cable news. There are all sorts of things that if we just embraced it and understood, once we realized we were in an information war, then all of these tactics for fighting it present themselves. Mm. But until we admit that we're in an information war, we don't do any of it. And I, I put the, the, a lot of uh, this is, you know, blame goes to people for not seeing the signs that are there, but a heavy amount of it does go to media because they report on the fact and belief problem as if it were a natural disaster. No you know, one can do that. Why is this happening? No one, yeah, why is this happening? Like, they, report on, they report on this problem like it's a hurricane rather than a war. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, and because you can't fight a hurricane, but you can fight a war. I think they need to start using the word disinformation more. Mm -hmm. yeah, you argue uh, to de-platform so sources of disinformation and even yes. to... to you, you you know identify the amplification going on on social media. Are there good social media platforms out there, or should we just be attacking all of them? You know, they all profess to be doing more than they really are fighting disinformation. If you listen to the propaganda coming out of Facebook and Twitter, oh look at everything they're doing to fight all these inauthentic accounts, or you know all these. Uh, you know these sock puppets, these these messages, you know, with that that are uh, from troll, you know, from bots. Mm -hmm. They're they're not doing nearly as much as they could, because you know it's information warfare one hundred and one. You don't go after the lie; you go after the liar. When the mm -hmm. army fights this, when the counterintelligence people fight this, they go after the liar. So again, Soledad O'Brien. Don't have the liar in your program. Twitter could deplatform the liars. The Center for Countering Digital Hate found in 2019 that 65% of the anti-vax propaganda on Twitter was due to 12 people. Eight of them mm. still have a platform on Twitter. Why no. is that? Why? Why? And I mean, we've there's this whole debate now, just fresh on the news today, about this judge who said that the Biden administration can't can no longer even speak to the social media companies because he was afraid that they were colluding to silence conservative voices. What a disaster for, mm -hmm. never mind the fact that there's no evidence for that, but I mean, what a disaster for the fight against disinformation. Because, you know, what that means is, you know, yippee, more amplification, you know, less way that we can fight back against disinformation, less incentive for the social media companies to do anything. They could do a lot more. They just don't have the incentive to do it. You actually suggest that, you know, pressuring web servers and hosts that enable social media. That's right. How, how That's do we right. do that? Well, it's, uh, this was not my idea. I think this was Joan Donovan's idea. Um, every social media company, you know, it's easy to, go after Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. But there's also PayPal and Akamai and these other companies that host or service, you know, in some way. I've got a whole list of them in the book. How many people even know that they could write letters to those companies to try to get, you know, to complain about the disinformation on the sites that they're hosting? I mean, imagine mm. that, right? If you didn't like a business, you could go after the business. You could also go to their landlord and complain about the, the business that they're doing in their building. It's something like that. I mean, could could Facebook and Twitter do what they do without the consent of all the other web servers and companies that 
that propped them up. They could not. So that's a stealth tactic. That's a guerrilla tactic. I didn't think that went up. I, I believe, I can't remember uh, who was in the book, but I discussed it in the book. I think that was Joan Donovan who recommended hmm. that. Thank you. That that sounds very interesting. Um, one message, though, that is, is common throughout is, is that, you know, you have to fight polarization. This, yeah. this is really about amplifying and enhancing polarization and silos. And at one point you mentioned that attacking denialist beliefs is attacking these people's identity. And yeah. that's, you know, that's the easiest thing to do is to say, this is stupid. You're crazy. The, the facts are this, this, and this. They're just going to shut up because this is, you're attacking their identity. You're putting yourself into the other box by doing that. And, you know, you can't reach these people by attacking their yeah. beliefs. Is it? This goes back to my last book. Mm -hmm. You cannot get somebody to change their mind by cramming facts down their throat. If, if you're going to try to change somebody's mind, the best way to do it is through calm, respectful conversation face to face. Now, that doesn't always work. But it's sort of the only thing that does work if anything's going to work. Now, we've got a split here, right? Because one thing that led to me writing the new book was realizing that you can't debunk your way out of an infodemic. You need to also pre-bunk. You need mm. to you know, worry about how to get people in that, in that space. You've really got to do both at the same time. But the the scale of the problem seems to me to be growing worse over time, primarily because of the amplification. And it's kind of one of these things where, you know, if you don't get ahead of it, if you don't debunk fast enough, then, you know, they're sharing bad information amongst themselves and, you know, more people getting sick. It's like any other epidemic, right? If you don't, you've got the moment when you could get ahead of it. And if you don't, well, then you're managing it wild in the population. And so I'm, I'm trying to, I wrote the earlier book about debunking. I'm writing this one about really about uh, pre-bunking. Yeah, no, that, and that's great. And you, I think we also have to spread the message that that attacking the beliefs and belittling the holders of these beliefs as uh, morons or as undesirables yeah. is not going to help. It's actually going to hurt. Playing into the polarization, you have to realize these yeah. people are victims of disinformation. And That's what right. we need to do is Correct. get on the same page for the goal. We need to have buy-in that we want to fix the system because if we don't get that buy-in, they're going to destroy the system. The, the, the main message I'd like to get out to folks who believe conspiracy theories and are you know, vaccine deniers and such is you've been lied to. You, you've been lied to by somebody who made a profit off the fact, that, I mean, they're exploiting and you don't even know it. Now, it's very hard to convince somebody of that. As uh, Mark Twain said, you know, it's easier to fool somebody than to convince them that they've been fooled. But mm -hmm. I think that is the root, right? Um, mm -hmm. And to do that successfully, you have to fight polarization, not just of the believers, but in yourself. You can't be so polarized that you think these people aren't worth talking to they're they're stupid it's beneath me why should i waste my time you can't look at it that way you mm -hmm. have to look at them as as you said victims people who have caught the disease of disinformation and you know need to be saved from this uh, i think i think a certain amount of empathy is necessary and it is hard it is very hard to have empathy under these circumstances but i think it's uh, i think it's necessary I think uh, that's a great message that you've gotten. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and chat with us and, and tell us about your new book. And I, I wish you luck in, in fighting the war against disinformation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patreon.podbean.com slash the rational view. Thanks for listening.